Yeah. Your partner there, Sarah, likes to hang out at the mall. Now, what do you do while you're just hanging at the mall, Sarah? Well, check out guys and spend money. Check out the dudes and spend the cash. Your cash or like parents' cash? Mine. No! Okay, go. <laughs> So her day has finally come. Despite all the delays, the eight fired attorneys, and her general willingness to waste everyone's time, Sarah Boone's jury trial started on Friday, October 18th, 2024. And might I just add that for someone who is supposedly innocent of murder, she sure has become very comfortable in jail over the past four and a half years. So comfortable, in fact, that she requested Doritos and Pop-Tarts to snack on during the trial. And of course, that was denied. And before we begin, I think it's important that I mentioned that I'm going to have to gloss over portions of the opening statements due to the attorneys not speaking into their microphones. That said, let's get started. This is day one of Sarah Boone's trial, the suitcase lady. Ma'am, good morning. Can you please state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. All right. Miss Boone is seated at council's table wearing a black suit and a pink blouse. She is in custody in this matter. However, there are no restraints that are affixed to her person. So then they spend over an hour arguing about some mundane evidence that's totally irrelevant and whether or not they get to use visual aids in the opening statements. And we're just going to skip past all that and go straight to the entrance of the jury. Any reason why we cannot bring in our jury at this time? State. Defense. All right, let's stand and bring in our panel. The judge sounds even more annoyed than I am. Y'all may be seated. Members of the jury, we're going to proceed with opening statements this morning. Both the state and the defense will have the opportunity to present them. I ask that you listen closely to those statements that they're going to provide. But remember, these are not evidence. This is just the party's belief as to what the facts and the evidence will show in this case. After the conclusion of the opening statements, we'll be bring, begin with the state's case in chief through witnesses. With that, Mr. Jay, you may proceed, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, what the evidence in this case So as you can see, the microphone is over here, but Mr. J is over here, and that's why we can't hear him. He's speaking directly to the jury, and the only really important thing he says is that at the time of death, Jorge Torres was 103 pounds. But luckily for us, the portions of his opening statement that are the most important require him to read from the podium, which just happens to be connected to the microphone. From a video that began at 11.12 p.m., 45 seconds, on February 23rd, 2020, in Orange County, Florida, is a suitcase on the ground, face down, with the zippers facing the floor. You will hear Sarah the defendant will say, for everything you've done to me, Sarah, for everything you've done to me, Sarah, fuck you. And then the defendant laughs, Sarah, fuck you. And the defendant laughs, Sarah, stupid, Sarah, that's my name. Don't wear it out, Sarah. I can't fucking breathe, baby, seriously. Yeah, that's what you do when you choke me. Sarah. 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 The defendant laughs again. Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. She laughs again. That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe. She laughs again. Unintelligible words. And I would submit the evidence is going to show, because of the intoxication from alcohol, is the next thing she says. Sarah, Sarah, S Sarah, I can't breathe, baby. That's what I feel like when you cheat on me. Sarah, fuck you. I can't fucking breathe, Sarah. You should probably shut the fuck up. Sarah, shh, is the last thing you will hear the defendant say to Mr. Torres as he is face down, zipped shut in a suitcase. That, again, began at 11, 12, 45 and lasts just over two minutes. At 11, 23 and three seconds p.m., there's a second 22 second video and it's the defendant zooming in on the suitcase and all you hear during this 22 seconds after he's been in this suitcase 
since at least 11, 12 p.m. is one more time, Sarah. How did we get to this point where 103 pounds... And then, of course, he walks away from the microphone again, and he explains to the jury what happened the next morning. Sarah comes downstairs and sees that Jorge is still inside the suitcase. So she unzips him, his legs pop out. Then she calls her ex-husband, Brian. He comes over and immediately says, you need to call 911. And while Mr. J is explaining all this, Sarah is frantically taking notes. But now we're just gonna skip to the transcript of the 911 call. My boyfriend and I were playing last night. Put him in a suitcase and we were playing, hide and seek kind of thing. I fell asleep, found him dead in the suitcase this morning don't know what happened. He had blood coming out of his mouth. Don't know if it was an aneurysm. Pulled him out of the suitcase, tried to give him CPR. He was in the suitcase and I fell asleep. He's not awake, he's purple, he's not breathing. There's some instructions about how to do CPR given to her, asking about whether an AED uh, is available to, to shock his heart. It's too late, he's cold, he's stiff, he's purple. We were playing hide and seek. We were playing hide and seek. This is horrible. This is horrific what happened. Like, what happened? We were playing hide and seek last night and I fell asleep. So she mentions that there was blood coming out of his mouth. And so this time when he walks away from the mic, he talks about Jorge's actual cause of death, which was obviously asphyxiation. But he did mention that it wasn't just caused by the suitcase, but also the position that he was in caused him to suffocate faster. And he also had marks and bruises from being beaten. So after going over that, Mr. J reads the statement Sarah gave to the detectives on the scene that day. The basics of what the defendant tells them is we had wine, <coughs> we painted, we drew, we did puzzles. The particular wine we had was a Chardonnay from the Woodbridge uh, Winery. The bottles, plural, are in the trash. We started about 4 p.m. after uh, Mr. Torres went to the store. Puzzles, art, listening to music, enjoying each other's company. We were just literally just enjoying one another's company. The other bottle of wine that was left over from Boar wasn't even half full, so the description she is saying is one bottle of wine and plus a fraction of a bottle of wine left over from the night before. Ladies and gentlemen, not all bottles of wine are made the same. Many of us may envision uh, what you would expect at a restaurant. Those are 750s, 750 milliliters of um, that. Bottles of wine that were recovered from the defendant's trash can were 1.5 liters. So the equivalent of two standard bottles of wine. A 1.5 liter bottle of wine is 50 ounces, given that a standard serving of wine is five ounces, you can begin to do the math. And there's receipts. The day before, Saturday, February 22nd, 2020, there is a receipt from Publix for a bottle of Woodbridge wine for $9.74. And then Sunday at 12.17 p.m., there is another receipt for $9.74 for a Woodbridge Chardonnay bottle of wine. And then at about 5.30 in the afternoon on February 23rd, again, there is another receipt for the same bottle of wine for the same price. And those two bottles of wine were recovered. They're going to be produced to you in evidence and you will see that they are in fact Magnum bottles of wine. So, that's the context of, that we're dealing with when we hear things like, we only had one bottle of wine and we finished what was left in the bottle of wine from before. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's two 1.5 liters that apparently were consumed by a 103 pound man and the defendant who is in the same weight class. Plus, if you believe that the defendant and the decedent would leave leftover wine from any given day, any additional wine that was remaining from the 1.5 liters from Saturday. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a lot of wine. So in that context, we were just having wine, enjoying each other's company. At one point we play hide and seek. She says she didn't zip it up all the way. There was enough room, in her words again, there was enough room for his little fingers to get out. We were still having a good time and whatever. And basically, you know, 
Mr. Torres is stressing out about jobs, his ex-wife, about money. And so they're just doing puzzles and doing things to keep his mind off of it. Doing art, playing with the dogs, dancing with the dogs, playing hide and seek. We were always trying to outdo each other where we could find each other the best. When they started playing hide and seek, she went up to the shower and then got tired of hanging out in the shower and came down. And that's when she found him playing around in the suitcase. We both thought it was funny. I'm going to zip you up. Two little fingers could stick out. And she went upstairs thinking, he'll get out. We're going to have sex and go to sleep and call it a day. It was a good day. She insists that they had wine, but we're not drunk. You will be able to assess that for yourselves when you hear the recording she made. No ill will between us last night. Last argument, maybe last week. Don't really argue. We came home, drink, smoke, did art, listen to music, play with the dogs. We drink what we can afford. We used to be able to afford liquor, but now we can only afford wine. And that's how that day ends with the police. She goes and sleeps and stays at her ex-husband's house the night of February 24th. What they are doing, and by they I mean Orange County Sheriff's Office, in part, is going to her phone. That's when they discover the two videos that I just described for you. And there's other things in the phone, which I will discuss with you in a little bit. But uh, she's summoned in for another interview. And she sits down and gives another interview on February 25th, now Tuesday. She does describe past instances of violence. You're going to hear about that. She's going to say, Mr. Torres had hit her with a curtain rod about a month ago. Since then, though, like we've been good. I've been good. She describes that he comes at, him, comes at her all the time. He comes at me. So it's either I flee or I try to go upstairs and go to sleep. That's usually what it is. I don't know if you talk to uh, Brian, her husband, about any of that. But most of the time, I, I flee and I go over there. There's a discussion about why she stays with him. And you'll hear that for yourself. She will say that she doesn't really want to drink. She just takes an occasional drink. She drinks to placate him, Mr. Torres. She says that you're going to see phone videos of Mr. Torres smashing her TV in the past, like a month earlier. You may see that too. But she doesn't get drunk. When she drinks, she likes being non compos mentis, her words, not mine, having her wits about herself. Then she gets to the hide and seek again and describes that they've played it three times before, but had never zipped one another shut in it before. And they were really just running out of places to hide because it's just a town home. She does not remember, according to her, she does not remember taking any photos or videos of the night's events. At this point, they ask her, well, would you like to see it? And she says, I can't watch this. I flipped him over, I flipped him over, and that's where it was. Guys, this is killing me right now. That's why I flipped it over between the two videos. I, I didn't do anything intentional. Discussion over whether he had too, or enough room to get any of his fingers out from the zipper. My intention was not to leave him there. We both got in there. Both of us were in there. When she went upstairs, my plan was not to, quote, he'll be up here any minute. My plan wasn't to leave him in the suitcase. Why is all this going on? It's the drinking. That's what it is. It's the drinking. I thought it was like I thought he was OK. Guys, that's, that's how we were with each other. Nobody understands our relationship. This whole suitcase thing never happened before, though she described it happening before. I'll never drink alcohol again. She insists that she has no injuries on her. And you don't have to take her word for it because they took photographs of her and there were no injuries on her. She insists over and over that there was no violence that day. It's like, OK, we're in a good place right now. They ask her about saying fuck you to Mr. Torres. Well, that's just being playing, playful and having a good day. Everybody's having a good day. I didn't touch him, nor did he touch me. Her words. What else is found on her phone? There's a conversation between uh, Mr. Torres' brother, and again, nobody knows who's using these phones at the time text messages are sent in these records that you're going to see. But it's indicated that there's a communication between one of the decedent's brothers and the owner of the phone that was taken that belongs to Ms. Boone. The text from the brother is, yo, my daughter told me what you did, Sarah. I don't want you around any of my daughters or nieces and nephews. And that's Christmas. 2019, just under two months before this event, she replies, or the person using her device at this time, Ugh, your quote unquote dad hit me in the face. The next text is, hide and seek. 
I shall. January 13th, there's another heated discussion. She describes it on January 13th in a text to Mo, the brother again. It's a Torres thing. Boo sends a picture. Keep the fugly creep out too. It's still fugly. Lose. The brother responds, please do something with yourself, Sarah. God bless you. The defendant's response, and bless you and all of you too. I'll get, in all capitals, rid of him. Then it'll be, in all capitals, better. Ugh, Torres. Referring to Mr. Torres, getting rid of. And that's the case. And then Mr. J walks away from the mic again. And I suppose it doesn't really matter because those text messages that he just read were extremely bad for Sarah's case. But Mr. J spends the rest of his time speaking directly to the jury as far away from the microphones as humanly possible. And I understand why attorneys do that because the case is really all about the jury anyway. And all he basically does here is tell the jury what he thinks all the possible defenses might be and why they're all wrong. But I'm guessing that Sarah's attorneys will probably throw as many curveballs as they possibly can. So then we begin the opening statement for the defense. Thank you, Mr. J. Any opening remarks by the defense? Judge, can we invoke the rule? It has been. I've already advised the witnesses. Okay. The rule of sequestration will be invoked. Thank you. You may proceed, sir. And, of course, he walks away from the microphone immediately. But eventually the audio does get better, so I'm just going to start it right there. Sarah Boone and George Torres were down and out, as you can be. Their life centered around alcohol. Both of them suffered from, used to be called alcoholism, now it's called alcohol abuse syndrome. And so day to day, they struggled with the use of alcohol. You can imagine that it affected their jobs, it affected keeping employment, it affected even getting a job. As codependent as you can be towards each other. And you're going to learn, with all that, was domestic violence. And that George Torres physically abused Sarah Boone. And she suffered from the effects, the psychological effects, that one suffers from repeat <coughs> violence from an intimate partner. They were together over three years. And there were several prior incidences of violence. We've got the photographs. There were incidences where police were called who took photographs. So you're going to be able to see the evidence. And believe we believe the court will instruct you at the end when you're considering self-defense, which we call justifiable use of non-deadly force or justifiable use of deadly force, that you can consider the prior acts the history of violence, the prior difficulties that the parties had. And considering her set of circumstances that she was faced with in making the decision to use reasonable force under the circumstances. And the most important thing I can tell you here today is keep an open mind. There's two sides to every story. You're going to hear the state's side in attempting to paint her a certain way, as they've done here today in opening statements. And then you're going to hear another side. And you're going to have to weigh that. All the evidence. The credibility of the witnesses. The photographs. The videotapes. And come to a conclusion. Now let's talk about this day, February 23rd of 2020. The date of this event. This, this case has been pending for some time. Here we are. October of 2024. I think the evidence is going to show that they had purchased some wine the day before, but they hadn't finished all of that. So it was in the refrigerator. Many times that's how they start their day. At some point, you're going to see a video from Publix, from where they live. I believe it's Winter Park. But Publix was not too far from their apartment complex. And they took their car, they drove over there. So you're going to see a videotape from Publix of them both going in the store, 
about noon, and they come out with one of those larger bottles of the wine, and then, of course, uh, there's a receipt, and the bottles are in the garbage can. Of course, there obviously is an attraction between the two. And as everybody knows, um, couples can have great times where things click, everybody gets along, and then we can have episodes of disagreement. And how are those resolved? Really, is what this is about. How are disagreements resolved? But George was very jealous of Sarah. And you're going to hear the testimony about that. And that he cannot, in certain situations, he can be very charming. But when his level of intoxication gets to a certain level, is when he gets sad, moody, and a lot of times eventually it involved forcible sex with Sarah Boone or actual physical violence against her. They bought the wine. It's a simple life. They don't have much money. Uh, but they both like art. They did that for a while. They both like puzzles. They did that for a while. Well, about five or so, the wine bottle was gone. And George had said, I want to go get some cigarettes. So there's a convenience store right close by their apartment complex. And, and Sarah thought he was just going to walk over there and get cigarettes and come back. Well, what he did was he, he got her keys, he got her debit card, and he went over to the Publix and he got another bar. And I think that was about five, five thirty something like that. And again, there'll be the Publix video showing him going in and going out, and there'll be a receipt for the purchase of that bottle, and then there'll be that bottle. Will be in the garbage can along with the other bottle. Well, when he comes in with the second bottle, Sarah, Sarah knows this is not good. She knows this means he's going to get to another level of intoxication. So Sarah's concerned. Attempts to placate him, keep him busy, keep him in a good mood. They drink that bottle, or well, she drinks as well. And at some point, they're intoxicated at a high level. As some people do when they're drunk, they get silly. And they decide to play a game of hide and seek. She goes upstairs, their bedroom's upstairs, to the shower and waits for a period of time. And he doesn't come to her. At some point she gets cold, she gets tired. She wants to go see, well maybe, maybe we got it mixed up. Where is he? So she goes downstairs and they had gotten a suitcase down a week or so ago. It's an old suitcase. Uh, that they were going to donate to Helping Hands or Goodwill or somebody, and they were putting some items in there. And it's a broken down suitcase. It's a large suitcase. They both weigh about 100 pounds. Uh, and they don't eat good. Mal malnourished to a large degree. The pull handle is broken off. And they've attached a little uh, paper clip it's got the rubber around it, and that's how they pull it back into it. Well, she comes down the steps. She sees him getting in and settling in the suitcase. So she walks over there, and you know they see each other, and they smile and laugh, and she, she zips him up. And she zips him up, and they laugh for a while. They carry on. She sits on the couch. And at some point, he says, I can't breathe. Now, his face is facing the zipper, and she's got, she's got two or three inches that she's opening. And she doesn't know. They're intoxicated. She doesn't know whether he's just saying that to try to get her to get him out or what. But he's a captive audience. <coughs> Physically, they're the same size, but he, he's much stronger than her. If they got in a fist fight, he would win 100 times out of 100. But she's got him now. He claims he can't get out. He has to sit and listen. It's a unique form of physical restraint. And so she lets him have it. Says things she shouldn't say. You'll see the video. It's about two minutes long. She videotapes it. She sits on the couch and turns her phone on and videotapes it for about two minutes. There's another video that's approximately 11 minutes later. The first video, George's, the, the suitcase is flipped upside down. The zipper's are off. 11 minutes later, Sarah has flipped it right side up, again, open for him to get out, and it's only 22 seconds. 
and you hear George say Sarah. And that's it. Now the key to the case is that 11 minutes and what happened during that 11 minutes. Okay? That is the key to this case. Sarah Boone will take the stand. She will explain what happened. She will explain why it happened. The evidence will show that she was justified in the action she took to prevent the attack from George Forrest, which the law acknowledges that every one of us has a right to invoke the right of self-defense. You can hear from the medical examiner. She is going to tell you about some bruising on George Torres. Of course, he was in the suitcase a while, deceased, we believe. And that changes things a little bit, as the medical examiner will explain. But there's some bruising. Sarah's going to explain that to you. Why that happened. What were the circumstances surrounding that? Involving the bat. Her son comes and stays with them from time to time. He has his own room. He has several of his things there, and there's a bat downstairs. The same bat that George Torres used, and there's a video where George is threatening Sarah. And he's swinging the bat at the TV about as hard as he can. And he does it about six or seven times. You'll see it. Sarah's recording it, and it's during an argument. And he's trying to intimidate. And you're going to hear about Sarah Boone and her struggles, her mental health struggles. Sarah had no intent to kill. The prosecutor mentioned she wanted him to die. Farthest from the truth. She loved the man. She hated the abuse. She couldn't leave him. She tried. She tried kicking him out six or seven times. He kept coming back. She changed a lot. He kept coming back. She didn't have the family. She didn't have the support. She was weak, vulnerable. You're going to hear it all. You've got to take that all into account to try to understand what happened and the circumstances surrounding this tumultuous relationship. Now, you're going to find that Sarah's not perfect. As many of us do when we drink too much, you, know, you sleep in. She slept in. 11, 12, 1, somewhere around there. She moseys downstairs looking for George. She thought he was on the computer looking for a job. She looked outside. Maybe he's out smoking a cigarette. And she sees the suitcase. She unzips it. She gets him out. He's purple. She tries her best to do some CPR. She freaks out. She... she the only, the only family she's got is her ex-husband, really. She relies on him. As the prosecutor said, a lot of times she'll flee to her ex-husband's house. And her son is at it. Lucas. It's the only thing she knows to do. She's kind of a, she was kind of a sheltered daughter when she was younger. She's smart, but she's, she's not worldly. And she calls Brian. Look, what do I do? He said, I'm coming over. Please, please come up. He's, he's about five minutes away. And she calls him again within a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the way. He gets there. He walks in the foyer and sees his legs. And she called 911. She calls 911 within a minute. To, uh, Detective Rodriguez arrives. You know, they've got the body cam now. So it's, it's recorded. So you're going to hear Sarah talking. But Sarah's freaking out. Sarah's thinking... And I'm, I'm, I'm somehow responsible. Eventually, she gives a statement to law enforcement. She gives one to Detective or Deputy Rodriguez. Of course, she's not the homicide investigator. She just responded. She's the first responder. And you know, they know what to do. They try to assess the situation. They start putting the tape out. And then they call for the homicide investigators to come, which takes a little time. So she gets a statement from Sarah. Eventually, the homicide detectives get a statement from Sarah. And the one of the unmarked squad cars, and it's recorded. You may hear that. And then the next day, they they take Sarah's phone. Sarah gives them the phone, signs the consent to take the phone, take it to. Uh, they have a phone phone extraction people at the sheriff's department where they can take it and 
take out all the data, all your phone calls, text messages, photographs, videos, all that. And they find these two videos. Sam is not aware, she doesn't remember making the video. If you can imagine. She gives them the phone. Of course, she makes no attempts to do anything other than, here's the phone. So they tell her, you, you, you're going to get your phone back tomorrow. We'll bring it back to you tomorrow. Well, they end up having a conversation with the female detective, homicide detective, Copson, is her name. Chelsea Copson. And they end up, Deputy Copson was pregnant, or Detective Copson was pregnant. So they end up, hey, um, we're not going to bring your phone. I'm not feeling good. I'm pregnant. Can you, can you come to the sheriff's department? Which Sarah Ben was telling me that that was what I was going. That's what they told me I was going to the sheriff's department for. Well, instead, it was an interrogation. And they were going to arrest her. They made their mind up on it. And they were going to confront her and try to get her to confess based on the two videos. And so there's approximately a two-hour interrogation that was on the 25th in the afternoon when she got there to get her phone. They said, well, we got to come up here. We need to talk to you. And they got her in the room. It's a small room, but it's being videotaped and audio taped of them trying to get a confession to murder. And it doesn't happen. But Sarah lies. She's scared. She can tell they're trying to pin her on this, that this was some kind of intentional act. And it was not. So she lied. She's not a lawyer. She doesn't know about self-defense. She doesn't understand she has a lawful right to defend herself. She doesn't understand that she's justified in using the force that she used. I wasn't there to advise her. No lawyer was there. So she lied. And you're going to hear that. So you're going to have to balance that versus her taking the stand and testifying for you. And we simply ask that you look for the evidence of cooperation of her testimony. It's going to be later, probably next week. The judges will tell you and read an instruction on evaluating a witness's credibility. And they'll talk about cooperative evidence, other evidence that's consistent with the testimony that Sarah Bill would give you. So you're going to have to weigh that. Now, self-defense, you know, we talked about it in jury selection, usually a gun, some deadly weapon. The suitcase in this case was a physical restraint or a blocking of an attack. But it was unconventional. Self-defense, nonetheless. Now, as I said, the struggles that it heard, many of them involved the police. So you're going to actually hear from some of the police officers. Maybe some body cam footage. You're going to see some photographs that they took of the injuries to Sarah Ben. And some of the videos you may see of her in a very happy, joyful type of thing. Well, number one, she's intoxicated. Number two, she's safe. We so there. So her attitude is not a one of distress. You know, we're here, we're here today, full packed courtroom. Judge Grant's here. But, but you're the most important people because you've got to decide this case honestly, fairly, and according to the law. And we talked about the two biggest principles from the Constitution that apply. In this case, and in every case in which a citizen like Sarah Boone is brought into a courtroom and accused of a crime. The first is, you as a juror must presume or believe that Sarah is innocent. And that belief stays with you throughout the entire trial. Because of that, she doesn't have to prove anything. That's why the state went first in jury selection. That's why the state went first today. That's why the state will go first putting on their case. They have the burden of proof. And it's the highest burden we recognize in any type of litigation in this country. Proof beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. You are going to have doubts about this case. But the most important thing is not to rush to judgment, to keep an open mind and understand there's two sides to this case. There's their side and there's our side. So you can't form any fixed opinions early on. That's hard to do, as Mr. Henderson said in opening or in jury selection. That's extremely hard to do. Now you're going to hear some testimony. There's been mentioned of experts. 
Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Victims of repeat violence may fear death in a situation others would not. After hearing both sides of this case, we're confident you're going to have a reasonable doubt. And we're going to ask you to follow the law and do justice in this case. And find Sarah Boone not guilty because it's the right thing to do. Jeez, talk about grasping at straws. If you actually made it through his opening statement without falling asleep, it sounds like they're going to blame Jorge for every form of abuse possible and that Sarah was helpless to get out of the relationship. But if you listen to the statement that the property manager of the apartment complex gave to the detectives, she paints a very different story. In fact, all of their neighbors gave statements claiming that the two of them would constantly beat on each other and that they would never separate. And considering the fact that Sarah's ex-husband Brian paid their rent, I think I have a pretty good idea why they stayed together. They were both drunk and unemployed. State, you may call your first witness. Sir, good morning. You could be seated. And once seated, you could state and spell your name for the record for us, please. Uh, Juan Torres, J-U-A-N-T-O-R-R-E-S. Thank you, sir. You may inquire, Mr. Cacciatore. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, can you tell us how it is that you know George Torres? He's my older brother. And uh, how many siblings do you have? Six. Six or seven. And how long has your family resided here in the Central Florida area? Uh, 20 plus years. And uh, before residing in the Central Florida area, uh, were you guys in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Yes, sir. And Massachusetts. Your brother, um, how often, uh, your brother uh, George, that is, uh, how often would you talk with him? Often we would talk, uh, let's say, on a weekly basis. And how far away did you live from George? Uh, about five, ten minutes. Pretty close. Would you see him pretty often? I would try not to go there too much. Who was George living with at the time that he passed away? Sarah. What was your relationship like with Sarah? Uh, we didn't really have a relationship. Would it be fair to say you didn't get along with her? Yes. Back on February uh, 23rd, uh, 2020, um, did you have an occasion uh, to talk to your brother on that day? Yes, sir. Did you FaceTime with him or did you speak with him over the phone? We talked on the phone. Was that phone to your ear or was that phone? It was um, on speaker. And who was present? my wife and my two kids can you tell us uh what that conversation what the topic of that conversation was um, just we were just talking like we normally did just he just calling me to check on me um, basically in the background of that conversation what did you hear um, sarah's in the background uh, Yelling. What was she yelling about? Something about choking or how he choked her. I really don't. That pretty much that was it. How did the conversation end? Because she was yelling in the background. So we just, that was it. We just. Did she sound upset? She sounded upset. Did you talk to your brother after that conversation? No, that was the last conversation I had. Have you ever spoken to Sarah since that conversation? No. I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? Good morning, sir. Good morning. In the beginning when you started, it was hard for me to hear, but I know you were talking about other siblings, other family members that you had here. Um, could you repeat that for me, please? 
here in in Orlando, I have one sister and three brothers. Now, did your brother George Torres did he ever stay with you at any time? No. Would he ever live with you or any of, I mean, not you, but any of your other siblings? No. All right, sir. Let's go back to this phone call that you were talking about. Who called who? He called me. Uh, did you notice anything about his speech or his voice? <clears throat> no, he was fine. Sounded normal? Yes, sir. Okay. So he wasn't slurring his words or anything like that? No. Uh, by the way he talked or what he talked to you about, could you tell at that time if he had been consuming alcohol? No, because I knew when he was when he would drink. Okay, so in your opinion, at that time, based on what you heard and what he was talking about, you do not believe he had been drinking alcohol. No. You said you heard Sarah. Yes, sir. Is that correct? How did you know it was Sarah? I can tell her voice. You recognized her voice, and you said that Sarah was yelling. Is that correct, sir? Yes. And she was yelling about, he's choking me. Or tell him about choking me. Uh, yes. Okay. During that conversation, and you heard her say that, did you ask your brother, what is she talking about? No, I did not. Did that statement at that time, did that statement surprise you? Not really. You've heard it before? No. Based on Sarah's voice that you've heard, uh, was it any indication to you that she had been drinking? No. No? Sir, uh, at some point your brother said he had to go, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, did he hang up on the conversation? Yes. And did he say bye and you say bye? Yes. Sir, other than um, siblings, your, your mother and father, do they live in this area? Yes. Uh, were there times that George would stay with them? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. No further questions. Any redirect examination? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Defense? Actually, we'll keep him subject to recall, Your Honor. Okay. I would agree with that. All right, sir. You release subject to recall by other party. Thank you. It would call Devin Jamro. So the prosecution brought in two pointless witnesses. The first was an assistant manager at Publix. They called him in just to testify that the receipts for the wine indeed came from his store and that there was security footage of the purchase of the wine. Then they called in the 911 operator. In one of my previous videos, I already uploaded the 911 call and they didn't even play it here. And the defense attorneys didn't ask either of these witnesses any questions. So we're moving on to the next witness. State, you may call your next witness. State Sir, you may be seated. After you're seated, if you can state and spell your name for the record for us. Vincent Battaglia, V I N C E N T B A T T A G L I A. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, can you tell us what it is you do for a living? Um, right now I work for an auto parts company. And where do you live? Uh, New Jersey. Back on February of 2020, where were you living at that time? I was living at the Tealwood Apartments in Winter Park, Florida. And what were you doing uh, at that time uh, when you were living at Tealwood? I was enrolled in Full Sail University. I was in school. Uh, were you neighbors with... Uh, with uh, Sarah Boone and George Torres? Yes. Approximately how long were you neighbors with them? About a year, a little over a year. I moved there in January 2019. How would you describe uh, the walls that separated your units? Thin, like very thin walls. Uh, would you ever have occasion to hear uh, arguing and yelling coming from Sarah, Sarah Boone in George Torres's apartment. Yeah. How often would you hear this? 
almost daily. Did Sarah Boone ever approach you about the things that you heard coming from their apartment? Yes. What did she tell you? Pretty much just kind of like, if, if I do hear anything, like through the walls or whatever, just out back, just kind of keep my mouth shut, like don't really speak about it or anything like that or say anything to anyone. And I just was like, okay. Did she make any motions with her hands? Yeah, like just kind of like, you know, finger over the lips, like kind of shh, like keep it hush, like that kind of thing. Do you recall the evening of February 23rd, 2020? I, I do, yeah. And what about that evening sticks out to you? The, that sticks out to me from that night was literally just the loud, there was a very, very loud noise that I heard that was loud and powerful enough to shake my bedroom wall. And I remember that because I was sitting on my bed on FaceTime with my girlfriend at the time, and I literally felt the wall shake and stopped me mid-conversation. And she even asked me through the computer, like, what was that? And I was like, I have no idea. Did you hear any yelling <clears throat> coming from their apartment on that night? Before that, yeah. Like, it was just a arguing kind of stuff. What was the last thing you heard? The last thing I heard was, like, the... The loud noise and just a little bit of shuffling, and that was kind of it. It just kind of went silent after that. Could you hear, hear anything that was being said? Not not clearly, and it, uh, it was never really anything clear. It was just like you could hear arguing back and forth, just kind of like um, and kind of like an "I hate you, I hate you," like it's whatever it is, whatever the argument was about, kind of thing. At the time, that's really all it was, but it was never really clear enough to hear like the full argument. And honestly, I never really paid attention too too much to it. If I heard it, I kind of stepped into my living room to be further away from it. Did you hear both the defendant's voice and also George Torres's? Voice? Yeah, yeah, all the time. You, it was like a back and forth. So, other than the statements and the phrases of I hate you, I hate you, you weren't able to discern the contents of this argument? No, no. What was the last sound you heard? The last sound that I heard was like the, the loud banging noise that, um, it was like a very odd sounding noise that I've never heard before this day, but it very much sounded like it was the, like where my bed was positioned. It was kind of towards the back of the apartment. And it almost sounded like it was coming towards me, but like on the side of me, you know? Then it was just like a loud rumbling noise. Like that literally sounded like it was kind of far away from me. And then it like ended up like almost next to me. And like I said, the walls are thin. So like, it's very easy to hear like through the walls and not even just sideways. Like I hear my upstairs neighbor, like all around very thin walls. Now, was your bedroom, uh, where was it located in your apartment? The back of the apartment, so it was like there's like a little kick out next to my patio, and that's like my, that was my bedroom back there, like uh, along the grass back there. On the first floor. On the first floor, yeah, yeah. I have no further questions. Okay. Any cross examination? Mr. Cagley, good morning. Good morning. Now you said that you lived there next to Sarah Boone and uh, George Torres for about a year. Yes, sir. Are you aware that? Uh, the police were called to their residence like while you were while you were there for the year are you aware of any any incident in which the police were called to their residence i had never seen anybody there but i had had other neighbors in the complex tell me that it has been on multiple occasions so that's just, why I, just just instead of what somebody else told you yeah yeah just what you would observe did you ever the year that you were there living <laughs> next to them yeah did you ever, were you ever aware that the police were called to their residence? No, the, the times that I was home, I never, I never saw any police at the, at the apartment there. Right. And you, did you work odd hours or? You went yeah, to and with my schooling and stuff too, I used to have class at like one o'clock in the morning. So I, all the time I was at random moments, like just not home throughout the day and night and stuff like that. So, yeah. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not, based on your interaction with Sarah Boone... Let me finish the question first, please. Do you, do you know 
from your experience with Sarah Boone and your experience with George Torres, that they drank alcohol? Yeah. Hang on. I'll withdraw to that question. Okay, thank you. Yes. Are you aware that they, they both consumed alcohol to excess? Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir, of course. My client was drunk at the time of the murder, and so was the victim. Therefore, she can't be held responsible. Come on, get real. Well, Vincent, I think you would testify. You, you may have given a statement to law enforcement. Yes, it was one of the detectives. A recorded statement? Yes, I can't remember his name, but yes. Okay, and I think it was on February 23rd of 2020? Pro yeah, right around that time, yeah. I believe you had said that... Um, I'm going to object this to uh, improper impeachment. Approach. Would it be fair to say on that date you got home around 7? 7, 7 uh, p.m. 7 p.m.? Yes. Uh, which day was this? Sunday, February 23rd, 2020. Uh, no, that day I actually got home from work probably around I th 1 or 2 o'clock or so. In the morning? No, in the afternoon. I, I went to work that morning at around 5 a.m. And you said that uh, you heard the normal yelling and arguing at about that time when you got home? Um, no, it was, it, well, yeah, it was around that time, but it was really around like... 10 o'clock, 10.30 is when, like, the arguing I could right here clearly. It was, like, around 10.30 at night. Okay. Thank you. Can you redirect? Just very briefly. Yes, sir. So on uh, cross-examination, you were asked uh, about uh, the, the arguing you heard, and you, I believe your testimony was that it was pretty in, uh, intense around 10.30. Yeah. Uh, approximately what time was it that you heard this loud crashing thump sound that you described um Just little after, after that an overruled um it was a little after that arguing and stuff it was probably around 11 11 15 probably 30 45 minutes after like the arguing i could hear started no other questions all right sir you are released not subject to recall have a great day thank you the state would call brandon moats Thank you, sir. You can be seated. State and spell your name for the record for us. Uh, yeah, my name is Brandon Motes, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-M-O-A-T-S. Thank you. Mr. Cacciatore, you may inquire. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Now. Good afternoon. Uh, can you tell us um, how it is that you uh, knew Sarah Boone? Uh, I moved into the apartment next door to her when I was in college. When was that that you were in college? Uh, I would have gone, moved down here in 2019 and would have been there until around like 2021, 2022. So she was your neighbor at Tealwood Apartments, is that correct? Uh, yeah, it would have been Tealwood back then, yeah. And uh, did you have any roommates back then? Uh, yes, I, I was rooming with uh, Vincent Battaglia. During that time, uh, what were you doing as far as work and school? And oh, uh, I was just going to school. You, uh, during the time of this, yeah, I would have just been going to school. I don't think I would have had my job yet. I was, I was just a student. Uh, did you have much interaction uh, with the defendant or with George Torres in this case? Honestly, I avoided them as much as possible usually. W would you ever have occasion to hear uh, arguing and yelling uh, going on inside of the defendant's apartment? Yes, they, they, the, the walls were pretty thin, so if people were yelling definitely hear it. And how often would you hear arguments or disagreements going on over there? When I first moved in, it was so like, it was at least like once a week to the point that I started tuning them out. Like I, I got good enough at just like not listening to them. They argued very, very often. Do you recall the evening of February 23rd, 2020? Yes, sir. Did you hear a loud crashing sound? Yeah, probably around 10.30, 11 o'clock that evening. Uh, the way their staircase was set up, I could, uh, my bedroom, the top of their staircase would have been like above my ceiling. And it ends next to where like my roommate's apartment was. 
so I could hear something start above me super loud and then fall away from me at, like at, like it was falling down the stairs. Did this, um, did this affect the walls that were between your two apartments? Oh yeah, me and my roommate, literally, I remember me and my roommate talking the next day about like we could literally like it shook both of our rooms. Did you ever have occasion to talk with the defendant about what happened? I never saw her after that. She would have, yeah, she, uh, I never saw her after that happened. No further questions. Any cross-examination? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, you were asked by the state if um, you had, had ever had any interactions with um, Sarah Boone or George Torres. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I think you said you tried to avoid them. Y yeah, uh, I don't like drunk people, and they were drunk a lot, so I did not interact with them. Okay. Do you, do you remember this interaction with Sarah Boone in 2009 when you woke up and witnessed Sarah? Sleep? I would have been nine years old in 2009. I'm sorry, 2019. Good catch. In 2019, when you woke up and witnessed Sarah sleeping on the concrete patio. Oh, this uh, this may have been a slight misconception in how I said this. I never uh, saw, uh, woke up and saw her sitting on the patio myself. That uh, I would have seen her on the patio eventually, but it's not like I woke up and went back and saw her on the patio. Uh, this was my roommate relaying the story that she had fallen uh, fallen asleep on the back patio, and then I like saw her okay. so you did not witness that yourself or did you see her i saw her asleep on the back patio i was just uh clearing up the sequence of events there do you recall our interaction with miss boone when you were coming home from school and uh she was trying to talk to you and she seemed paranoid and rambling yeah, I had I had gotten locked out of my apartment, so I was waiting on the uh, steps to. I was like waiting on the steps outside of my apartment for my roommate to get home. So she came up and started talking to me. Uh, I don't really remember too many like details of what she was saying because I didn't want to talk to her. She just, but yeah, okay. Do you remember saying that you believe Sarah was avoiding going into her apartment? That's definitely the vibe. I don't remember what she was saying, but like the vibe she was giving off was that she didn't want to go home. You said that the first arguments, other than the boom, which was like 10 something, uh, initially it was around 7, 7 p.m. You heard arguing? It would have, yeah, because it would have been. I rem I remember that day I got home from class around five because uh, I get, get got out of class around four thirty usually and walked home so I would have gotten home around five five thirty and it would have been after I took because I came home I made myself lunch and I took a shower and then I heard all of their arguing so it would have been about an hour and a half two hours after I got home so around seven to eight o'clock. And during that time, when you say arguing, was it back and forth? Uh, I honestly, I wouldn't really be able to say if it was back and forth. I, I don't know too. Uh, like, I wouldn't remember too too vividly if it was back and forth. Well, let me ask you this: yeah. you hear a male voice? I yes, I heard a male voice. Did you hear a female voice? Yes. Okay. Were they both loud? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Subject to recall. Jeff. All right. All right, sir, you're released. Subject to recall. Thank you. So then the court breaks for lunch for about an hour and a half. And if you've been wondering who those people are sitting behind the judge, after they came back from lunch, the judge sorry. gave us an explanation. Just in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, there are some uh, persons behind me to my right and my left. I run the mock trial program at Barry University School of Law here in town, and these are some of my students as a member of that program, so they're here just simply to observe. So pay no mind or attention to them. State, you may call your next witness. State, you call Brian Boone. Mm -hmm.
them shall be the truth, the whole truth, and I'll keep stuff up you Yes. Sir, good afternoon. You could be seated. After seated, if you could please state and spell your name for the record for us. Uh, Brian Boone, B-R-I-N-B-O-O-N-E. Thank you, sir. You may inquire. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, can you tell us how it is that you know the defendant? Um, I dated her for quite a while, and then we eventually got married. Did you have any children as a result of your marriage with the defendant? Yes, we had one son. And uh, how old is that son? Um, he is currently getting ready to turn 14. Approximately when was it that you uh, separated and began proceedings for divorce? Um, probably 2017, I'm thinking maybe. After your divorce, uh, what was your custody arrangement uh, with your son that you had in common with the defendant? Um, she was supposed to have him on Mondays and Tuesdays. I would have him Wednesday, Thursdays, and then we would alternate Friday through Sundays every other week. Uh, do you recall the events that occurred, I guess, first on the, the late evening of February 23rd, 2020? Um, on that evening, yes. uh, uh, well, apparently, uh, Sarah called me at one point during the night. Do you recall about what time she called you? I think it was 11 something. When you answered the phone, how did Sarah sound on the phone? She sounded like she had been drinking and was pretty drunk. Were you able to understand what the defendant was saying? Um... Somewhat, but she woke me up. I had work the next day. I was asleep when she called. Um, she's done this before, calling me late at night, and generally I kind of just try to ignore it, so I wasn't really paying attention. When she called you late that evening, uh, could you hear George in the background at all? N not that I remember, no. Now, the following morning, did you begin to call... The defendant. Yes, I did. Um, I think it was like 11 o'clock or something. And why was it that you were calling her? Um, well, it was going to be Monday. Um, I had had him on Sunday and dropped him off at school, and I was calling to try to find out if she was going to be actually picking him up that day. Why would you have a question about whether or not she was picking him up? She wasn't generally very good about actually getting him on the day she was supposed to. So it was not uncommon for you to have to remind her uh, to pick him up or to make sure that she, she was going to pick him up? Well, I mean, remind or just find out if she was going to or if she was just going to give him over to me as what happened. Do you remember at what time on February 24th you actually got in touch with the defendant? Um, I think it was like 1230 or something. What did she tell you on the phone? Um, that George was dead, and if I would come over. Did she say what happened to him? Um, I don't remember if she told me then on the phone or when I got there, but she told me they had been playing hide-and-seek and that she fell asleep. What did you advise her to do? Um, I told her she needed to call 911 and that I would come over as soon as I could. Did she call you again while you were en route to her residence? She did. She called to find out if I was um, still going to be coming over. What, if anything, did you advise her? I told her she needed to call 911 and told her I was on my way, but she needed to get somebody over there. How long did it take you to arrive? From the first phone call or? Yes, from the first phone um, call. Well, I mean, I don't live, I mean, I live a minute or two drive away, but I had to get my puppy. We, we had just gotten a puppy recently. I had to get him in his crate and stuff like that and put something on because I was working from home. And um, Total time, maybe 10 minutes. Tell us what she told you when you arrived. Um, that, um, I mean, George was dead. And I once again, I don't remember if she told me now or before that 
Um, they had been playing hide and seek and she fell asleep, but I at that time told her again she needed to get 911 called to get somebody over there. Had she called 911 at this point? No, she had not. So you've advised her now three times to call 911? Yes. Did you go inside of her apartment? I walked in the front door into the little tiled area, like entrance way thing. What, if anything, did you observe? Um, looking into the living room, I could see like the end of his feet and maybe a little bit of some legs that were kind of coming out around uh, the back side of the kitchen area. Did you continue to go into the apartment? No. Where did you go? Um, Sarah told me she was going to call 911 and go outside and have a cigarette and a drink and asked me to come out there with her. And I told her that I didn't really feel comfortable being inside. And I went out front and got in my car and waited for people to show up. Did you witness the defendant call 911? Um, I think I was in there when she dialed it and first got somebody on the phone. But I wasn't there for the whole conversation, no. I was outside. Did you stay there at the scene while police arrived? Yes. I, I was there. I was part of it. I knew I'd have to talk to somebody, so. Did you talk with law enforcement? I did. Sure, I have no further questions at this time. <laughs> Thank you. Any cross-examination? <laughs> we want to reserve our questions for when we call in in our case. Okay. All right, sir, you're subject to recall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just as long as he remains under subpoena. My understanding is subject to recall. So, so somebody will contact me about that? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. State, you may call your next witness. State, you call Abraham Moreno. Mr. Moreno, raise your right hand to Mr. Warren, please. Please, we are over the testimony. She gave Shelby the truth, the whole truth, and that's about the truth, so I hope you got it. Hi, everyone. Sir, good afternoon. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Abraham, A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Last name is Moreno, M-O-R-E-N-O. Thank you, sir. You may be seated. Mr. Castor, you may inquire. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Tell us, what what do you do for a living? I was, I'm a maintenance supervisor for apartment complexes. Um, is that what your position was back on, in February of 2020? Yes, it was. And what apartment complex? Tailwood Park Apartments. Did you have occasion to uh, meet the defendant in this case and also a George Torres? Yes. Let me turn your attention to February 24th of 2020. On that date, did you have occasion to come in contact with the defendant in this case? Yes, I did. And tell us, what was the circumstances I was called by the manager and the assistant manager to come to the to come to her unit. I believe she was already sitting outside at that time. What, if anything, did you observe uh, about her and about the unit? Um, the police was there. Her ex-husband was present. She was sitting outside, and and that's when she decided she wanted to talk to me and the managers. And what did she tell you? She's confused. She's not exactly sure what happened. Um, she pointed out that she recalls that they were playing a game of hide and seek. There was an instance where she was going to teach him a lesson. And then she just doesn't recall anything else until the next morning. Did she say she fell asleep? Yes, she did. Did she say things got out of hand? I don't really recall that part, but I do recall her stating that they were playing their game and that George um, went into a suitcase. And I didn't, I didn't ask any questions. I just let her talk for herself. How long was this conversation? For about four or five minutes. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Any cross-examination? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This conversation that um, you had with Miss Boone, yes, that took place on the twenty fourth. Is that correct? Yes. And who else was present on the time that the conversation was taking place? 
Standing right next to me would have been Melissa Sexton and Eugene Harris, as well as the officer who was in front of the door. Okay. So there was a law enforcement officer there that day, is that correct? Yes. Now, on the 24th is when you said that Ms. Boone made this statement to you. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, they were playing hide-and-seek? Yes. And what else did she say happened? She, she had told me that they were playing hide-and-seek, they had drank. Um, she was trying to teach him a lesson, and that was that. She went upstairs, she went to sleep, she woke up, she doesn't know what happened. Okay. So that was on the 24th. All right, on the 26th, uh, were, were you not interviewed by law enforcement? Yes. Okay. So I, may have my, I may have my days wrong, but it all happened on the same day. All right, the 24th, do you remember two days later that a Detective Scott Lowen conducted an interview with you at 4704 Lucia Court, Winter Park, Florida? Do you remember that interview? Yes. So that was two days later, is that correct? I would assume so. Yes. All right. So when he interviewed you two days later, did you tell him about this statement that Miss Boone made to you that you just told this jury in court? I did mention it to him. You did mention it to him? Okay. I mentioned to them that we did have a conversation. Did you tell him the content of the conversation? I may not have told him the whole content, but I did tell him we had a conversation. All right. Well, what did you tell him? What content did you tell him on that, the 26th? That they were playing hide and seek. That she was confused. She doesn't know what happened. I do believe I did mention to him the fact that she, had said that she was trying to teach him a lesson. Not that anything was done with malice. I didn't say that at all. Okay. So it's your recollection now today that on the 26th, you told Officer Lowen what you just told this jury. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Uh, sir, in preparing for this case, did you have a meeting with the Assistant State Attorney on September 23rd of 2024? Did I have a meeting? Yes. A brief chit-chat over the phone. A brief chit-chat that was over the phone? Yes, sir. All right. At that point in time over the phone, did you tell him, Sarah Boone, the defendant, stated that she was teaching him a lesson and, and things got out of hand and that she fell asleep? Yes. Is that what you told him? Yes. Okay. And that was in 2024 of September the 23rd of this year, 2024. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Are you telling us that back on... February the 26th of 2020, you told Officer Lowen at that time the same thing? If I recall, yes. So did she ever tell you how things got out of hand? No. Sir, uh, you testified that you knew both Mr. Torres and Ms. Boone, is that correct? Yes. Uh, you actually knew George Torres um, from a different time, didn't you? Yes, I did. When did you first know George Torres? In the 1990s. In the 1990s? He was a teenager and he lived down the street from me and my wife. So you had had a previous relationship with Mr. Torres? No, not at all. Not at all? You just knew him from then? Yes, as I stated, he was a teenager and I was an adult. Okay. During this time, though, that you became reacquainted with him, uh, did y'all uh, establish a friendship at that time here in Orlando? I wouldn't say a friendship, but an acquaintance, yes. Okay. Sir, on Monday, February the 24th, that would have been the day that you were with uh, Ms. Saxon and Jean Harris. Yes. Out in front of the apartment. Correct. Did you talk to law enforcement that day? No. You did not talk to them that day? <clears throat> I don't recall talking to them that day, no. Okay. Thank you, sir. I don't have any further questions. Any redirect examination? Just brief. All right, thank you. Back in the 90s, um, when you had previously uh, known uh, George Torres, in this case, where were you living at that time? I lived across the street. I lived on one block. He lived the next block over down in the middle. In what city? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. 
And uh, when did you move from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? 2018, I believe. So in the intervening years um, from your move from Philadelphia uh, to coming to work at Tealwood Park, did you have any contact with, uh, with, with George Torres? No. As a matter of fact, I moved from that particular block in 2005, so I don't meet Judge again until I work at Tealwoods. Which, when did you start working at Teal Woods? 2018, 2019, roughly there. No further questions. Can this witness be released? No, you're on this subject to recall. All right, sir. You'll be released subject to recall. Thank you. Thank you. State, call your next witness. State will call Deputy Kayla Rodriguez. So the next two witnesses are Deputies Rodriguez and Martinez. And the only reason they're here is so that the prosecution can bring in the body-worn camera footage that these two deputies recorded. And I'm afraid I'm skipping over their testimony and the body camera footage. And the reason that I'm skipping it is because I've already made a video on this. And that version looks and sounds a lot better anyway. So if you haven't already seen the body-worn camera footage from the officers or the interrogation video, go and watch this older video from a year and a half ago and then come back. Anyway, we're moving on. State, may call your next witness. Ma'am, good afternoon. Can you state and spell your name for the record for us? Uh, Melissa Ruffgarden, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-R-O-U-G-H-G-A-R-D-E-N. Thank you. Ma'am, who do you work for? I'm employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. So what is your position with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Currently, I am a forensic biologist with the forensics unit. Prior to this, I was a crime scene investigator for five years. Were you working in this capacity as a CSI on February 24th, 2020? Yes, I was. And tell us, where did you respond out to on that day? I responded to 4748 France Court, Apartment 3. And is that in Orange County, Florida? Yes, it is. And when you responded to that scene, whom did you make contact with? I made contact with the homicide detective, Chelsea Kepsel. Um, did you receive information uh, from the detective? Yes, that it was a death investigation. Did you walk the scene with the detective? Yes. And tell us, what does it mean to, to walk the scene uh, with the detective in a homicide? We go into the scene and uh, just observe. We don't interact with anything and discuss what we see. When you walked this scene, did you see George Torres? Yes, I did. And where was he located? He was located on the floor in the living room of the apartment. Did you, uh, with the detective, identify potential items of evidence to be collected? Yes. You had mentioned previously about documenting scenes with photographs. Was that done in this case? Yes, it was. Tell us, what is this? This is the front door to the residence. This is also the front door of the residence, just a closer image to the door. This is just inside the door. Uh, to the right, there is the, the kitchen area. So this is the uh, counter with the sink in the kitchen, and there's also the open area just above where you can see into the living room. This is a hutch inside the kitchen. You can see in the background that is where um, that first photo of the kitchen was taken, so that's the entryway. And then this is the hutch, and there is a cell phone um, on the hutch in the kitchen. This is the trash can in the kitchen. You can also see the hutch we were just looking at there on the side. This is the contents of the trash can. You can see two wine bottles on the top of the trash. Did you also find receipts in that trash can as well? Yes. These are those same wine bottles and three uh, Publix receipts that were removed from the trash can. Yes, this is just in further into that entryway. Um, you can see the living room. This is another photo of the living room. You can see the victim located on the floor and a suitcase in the bottom corner of the photograph. This is another photograph in the living room. This is that wall we saw in the kitchen there with the opening. Um, 
you can also see a wooden baseball bat leaning against the wall. Was that baseball bat collected into evidence in this case? Yes, it was. This is also a photograph of the living room, um, just the other, other side of the room. This photograph was taken in the living room. You can see the stairs leading to the second floor. This is a photograph of the living room just from the other side of the room. You can see the front door in the middle back of the photo. This is a more close-up photograph of the suitcase. This is a photograph of one of the uh, zippers on the suitcase. This is a close-up uh, picture of that same zipper. There is no uh, zipper pull on it. It appeared to be a small wire of some sort, the pink wrapped around the zipper. This is the zipper on the other side of the suitcase. The close-up image of that same zipper. There is also no zipper pull. This is the contents of the suitcase after just lifting the lid. More of a close-up image of the items. Um, there were miscellaneous papers and paperwork, some clothing items, and um, apparent blood inside the suitcase. What items of uh what apparent blood was inside the suitcase? Um, you could, it was observed on the white cap and a necktie, and there was also visible blood just um, on the interior of the suitcase. Um, the contents of the suitcase, but you can see the white, clap, white cap more clearly and the uh, blood observed on it. You can see the necktie with blood. It, it, it appeared to be silver multicolored. And then there's also a uh, diazepam syringe in the plastic uh, casing there. It was prescribed to the victim. That is the miscellaneous papers and paperwork that was removed from the suitcase. That's the suitcase after all of the items were removed. Yes, that is um, what appeared to be some like small pieces of paper um, that appeared to be soaked with blood. Is this inside of the suitcase? Yes is the baseball bat that was leaning against the wall in the living room. This is back to the stairs to the second floor in the living room. So it's moving closer to the stairs to the second floor, photographing um, more of the staircase. These are the steps leading to the second floor before I proceed up to the second floor. The upper portion of the stairs leading to the second floor. There were two bedrooms. This is the hallway. You can see a closet in the hallway and then the door to one of the bedrooms. This is a photograph within the child's bedroom. This is the door leading to the other bedroom upstairs. This is the bed within that bedroom. This is the uh, bathroom. This is the photograph I took of the defendant. This is a photograph of her hands facing upward. This is her right hand facing upward, her left hand facing upward, both of her hands facing downward, so the tops of her hands. This is her right hand facing downward and her left hand facing downward. During the time you were interacting with the defendant, did she ever indicate to you that she had any injuries? No. Do you recognize that package? Yes, I do. And tell us, what is that package? These are the two wine bottles that were collected from the trash can. Do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. This is the wooden baseball bat I collected from the living room. You also had an occasion to collect a suitcase as well in this case. Yes, I did. Prior to placing the suitcase into evidence, uh, did you process it? I took measurements of the suitcase. What are the measurements of the suitcase? It was 28 inches in length, 20 inches wide, and 8 and 7 eighths inches deep. What is this item? This is the suitcase I collected from the living room. Can you open the inside of it?
how easy is it to operate this, the zipper that closes the suitcase? It was a little difficult. I have no additional questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you also referred to as a medical examiner investigator as opposed to just crime scene investigator? No, that is not my title. Do you do reports that the, crime, or that the medical examiner necessarily relies upon in the process of doing the autopsy and additional um, investigations? You would have to ask them. Who makes the decision at the scene as to what items will be photographed and what items will be taken into custody and what items will necessarily be tested or analyzed? That's a collaborative effort between the crime scene investigator and the lead detective uh, while on scene. That would be yourself, and who was the lead detective? The lead detective was Chelsea Kepsel. Okay. Now, you authored a report in this matter, did you not? Yes. And that report uh, was utilized, if you in fact know, by the medical examiner in developing her autopsy report, was it not? Uh, I do not know. In your report, did you advise the medical or whomever might read your report that, in fact, the body had been removed from the suitcase by first offenders or first responders? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. And we know that you have the capacity to do DNA analysis, correct? Um, no, we process DNA and or collect swabs for DNA, and then that's submitted to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for conventional DNA analysis. You did that with uh, a sample from the inside of Sarah Boone's mouth? Her buckle swabs were submitted to the FDLE. And who made that decision? Uh, the detective and I. Who made the decision not to bother to do a DNA analysis on the blood uh, from the items within the suitcase or the suitcase itself? That was a discussion between the detective and I. And you chose not to do that? No, we did not. You assumed the blood inside the suitcase belonged to George Torres, correct? There was blood observed in the suitcase. But you don't know who that belonged to because you didn't bother to analyze it or have it analyzed, correct? The blood was not tested. Now, uh, State's Exhibit B, at the back, uh, you took that into evidence. Was that, again, a collaborative uh, decision by yourself and the lead detective? Yes. What efforts did you make to have the bat analyzed, uh, given the fact that it was apparently evidence? It was just collected as evidence from the scene. Did you advise either the lead detective uh, or anybody else involved with this investigation that there may be matters that could be analyzed when analyzing the bat that would help or assist in the investigation of this matter? Um, it's my job to do the documentation and the collection of evidence. Well, you said it was a collaborative effort between yourself and the lead detective, so did you participate in that decision? We chose to collect the bat and put it into evidence. And so there was a fiber analysis done on the bat to determine whether or not it was used to strike George Torres when he was in the suitcase, was there not? Uh, pardon? In fact, there was not, was it? There was no effort to analyze the bat. Jack, I don't believe the witness uh, had an opportunity to answer the question. Sustain. I'm, I'm sorry. Please. Can you repeat the question? I'm, if I can remember it, I feel. Do you know that there was any effort made in this particular investigation, the investigation of Sarah Boone, to analyze the bat for fibers? No, there was not. And why was that not done? It, it, it was not done. You indicated that you had some interaction with Ms. Boone, is that correct? I collected her buckle swabs. Did you speak with her? Uh, in collecting her buckle swabs, yes. Did you speak to any other witnesses? No. Did you make any determination of other matters that might be uh, of import or evidentiary, evidentiary value when you were going through the house and taking photographs and documenting the interior of the townhouse? You'll have to be more specific. Well, how many pictures of the child's bedroom did we see? Here today? Yes, ma'am. We saw the entrance to the bedroom as well as a photograph of the interior of the bedroom. What was the 
evidentiary value of that? It's my job to photograph and document well on scene. So the rooms in the upstairs were photographed and documented. Did you photograph holes in the wall, possibly made by the victim? I don't recall photographing holes in the wall now. Did you take photographs of items within the house or throughout the house that may have depicted incidents of prior violence? I'm, you'll have to be more specific. How about bloody pillowcases? Did you make any effort to collect and analyze pillowcases of the rooms that you were photographing? No. You have significant experience with zippers? I use zippers regularly, yes. Enough to have an, an opinion as to whether or not a zipper is stuck or not. Is what? Sorry? You just made, you testified on direct that the zipper was a little tight. Just that it was difficult without the zipper pulls to use the zipper. And that was your opinion? Uh, yes, from opening the suitcase here today. Today? You only tested it today? Pardon? You only today have for the first time tested the ability to pull open the zipper on the suitcase? No, I'm saying it was difficult today. A redirect examination. Yes, Your Honor. You documented uh, the, the entirety of the house as you saw it. Yes. So every room in the house? They were all um, taken overall photographs. Walls in the house? In, in the overall photographs, yes. They weren't all individually photographed, no. And you did not document or note any type of holes in the wall or any type of damage to the walls, anything like that? Not the walls, no. Is that something that would have been documented both photographically and also within your report? Yes. You also, as we've previously seen in the composite, saw the victim where he was laying in this case, correct? Yes. Was the victim, did he have blood on his mouth and on his face? Yes, he did. Did he have open wounds on his body? There was blood coming from his nose and his mouth. There was also some other uh, areas of, like, defects noted on his body. You also made contact with the defendant, too, as well. Yes. Did you know any other wounds or cuts or anything else that was not documented that you haven't testified to? No. So no wounds, nothing on her? Uh, not that I recall, no. No further questions. Thank you. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Owens, can this witness be released? Judge, we'd like her to be on call. Subject to recall, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Subject to recall? How far is he going to take this? I mean, it is surprising that they didn't DNA test that blood. But I think we all know who it belonged to, and so does Sarah. Anyway, that's the end of day one. I'll see you when day two is ready. It is 4.52. At this time, we're going to go ahead and take our recess for the evening. Um, with that, members of the jury, I'm going to release you back to the deliberation room for you to receive the paperwork for your employer. And we will see you at 9 a.m. this coming Monday, October 21st. And I thank you for your sacrifice and your service. Thank you.